Hello. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks very much for making it today. I wanted to start off this, this presentation here, which is going to cover storage on Ubuntu. This presentation is split in two pieces. I'm going to start talking about storage in general and what's new relating to storage in Ubuntu 16.04, the latest release, which just came out, came out last week. And we're going to have guests, Deutsche Telekom, come up here and talk about what their implementation of Ubuntu plus OpenStack plus their own technologies is coming into production. So to start out with, I want to just give you some background. So I'm, I'm a Canonical veteran. I've been here well, at Canonical for 11 years since Canonical was not even called Canonical. We were called NoNameYet.com. And so I've seen the company come in through a lot of different changes. And I've always put in charge of interesting projects that are sort of on the boundary there, things that are becoming interesting to the mainstream. So I started Canonical and worked on Launchpad, which came at the time when we were starting to think about distributed version control and how do we enable collaboration at scale, and which became the foundation for OpenStack development. Um, more recently, I've, well, I worked in, in, uh, for three years as VP of Engineering at Linaro, bootstrapping that organization who's focused on Linux on ARM. And more recently, I was brought back into Canonical to work on our storage product. And Mark came in and said, look, storage will become one of these things that is going to define what IT, the, the change in IT that's coming. And I was interested in that and started looking at, into it, right? Now, I, I'm not from a storage background, but I find storage to be something which is inherently easy to fall in love with. because Storage is the one thing that if you're an IT provider giving service, you know, delivering service to your own customers, it's the thing which everybody loves and everybody could use more of. So if you're only providing one cloud-based one cloud base or cloud-style product today it to, in terms of IT to your organization, provide storage because every application, every user can consume more of it. So if you think about delivering storage, there's really only one important requirement, and that is price, right? Yes, people will say there needs to be, storage needs to be high performance. Sure, it needs to be high performance, but at what cost? So the important thing is getting the storage price right. But even that is not exactly true. So if you are delivering storage services in 2012, it's not just getting the price right, it's beating the AWS price. This is what's going to steal your own IT budget in the coming years, because if you're slow at, prov at providing storage or if you're providing it too expensively, then your customer is going to say, hmm, instead of buying from my own IT department, I'm going to set up a credit card and start buying it off AWS. So that's really what the, what the challenge is today. If you're providing in-house storage as a product for your own organization, remember this. You're going to be benchmarked against AWS prices, whether you like it or not. It won't be an immediate transformation. People are not going to just drop your, your SANS and NASs and go wholesale to cloud storage. But there will be a, a, a trend in there, and it will be eroded over time. So let's look at beating AWS prices. This is a comparison between disk drive prices, which is really, really like the atomic unit that you need to have if you're providing storage at all, with what AWS rents that for. So if you look at disk costs and AWS costs, there's a multiplier there, right? And this is looking at the block storage side of it. So on block storage, you can see there's like, I don't know, 70, sorry, yeah, um, 7 to 4x, sorry, 7 to 30x multipliers there. And if you look at object storage, and you can argue that Glacier is not disk, and Glacier, who knows what exactly it is. Is it, is it tape? Is it optical? Is it a mix? But if you compare in object storage, the gap there is, is also exists, right? Now, this is a bit of a false dichotomy, right? Because on one side, I'm saying, this is what the cost of a single disk drive, and this is what it costs to provide storage service. But it's an important dichotomy, because if you're looking on, on the, on the left-hand side here, then you're saying, whatever I put on top of this is fat that's going to eat into my margin. So if I need to triple replicate, which is the industry standard, then already I have 2x fat on top of that original cost. Now, there's one thing which is, is helpful for somebody who's, who's providing on-premises on storage, which is AWS puts in the fine print that it will charge you more if you try and pull your data out. So this is an important additional cost to factor in when you're doing the comparison there. But fundamentally, you need to do that comparison yourself when you're providing your own storage in, internally. All right. So there is the multiplier there, and it's not trivial to beat AWS. But it's definitely possible, right? It's possible because you can, at the end of the day, attach one drive and, or three drives, and you get 3x replication, 
to an existing cluster, and you still haven't lost to Amazon. But in the long run, you have to think about how do I expand, how do I actually make my platform available at scale at a competing cost. So my message is push for the lowest overhead per disk possible. Look at the disk costs and look at what overhead you're putting on top of that. The smaller it can be, the better off you'll be in the comparison. OK, so putting storage on a diet in practical terms mean, means two things. First, if you're working with appliances because you have high performance, high IOPS, or legacy storage that's there, well, remember, use your appliances wisely because they need to be used at the places which actually demand standard NAS grade performance. And if you use these for archival, then you're paying too much for something which should, at scale, be going to a cheaper option. And you should look at software defined because software defined, as we've seen happen in the compute space, will come into storage in the same way, changing the way people think about how to allocate storage, how to deploy storage. Increasingly, archival is now considered to be software defined in the leading organizations out there because it's the only cost effective way to put the minimum fat on top of the per disk price. At Ubuntu, I'm, I'm talking about this, the, the cost point, because at, at Canonical and what Ubuntu stands for when we're talking about private cloud is making your own IT cost effective against a public cloud. How do you survive in a world of AWS, Google, Microsoft giants? It's only if you really look at your costs and make sure that you've got the right balance there. So first, full automation. If you want to compete with anyone who's doing automation at Google scale, you have to be as automated in-house. So the work that we've done around automation tooling with Maz for bare metal, with Juju for the actual modeling and, and deployment of the software there and for the management on top of it, that's required if you're going to provide cost-effective storage. You can't just rely on imaging the, the, the systems yourself, using your own hackery wackery to get the stuff up and running. You can't do that. It has to be fully deployed, automated out of the box. Add 10 more nodes. You put 10 more nodes in, and the system has to auto reconfigure. This is what you get when you're using Juju and, 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 and Maz. And I hope that that's what you're aiming for internally as well. Second, if you're running OpenStack and you're going software defined, then why not put storage on the same servers as you're running your compute? You save on storage servers. Already there's less fat per disk there. So in Canonical's reference architecture, what we deploy for our OpenStack customers, we put Nova and Ceph, if you're using Ceph as your software defined storage, on the same node. Why do we do that? First because we can, because of performance today and because the containers provide you with that guarantee that it will run stably. But second, because you avoid having to worry about the storage cluster that you need to put alongside your open stack. Put the two together, it makes sense. Erasure coding with smart caching. So you, yes, you may think that you need to eat into the 3x replica because that's what's required for your application. But if erasure coding is at all possible, Explore that erasure coding and perhaps a fast caching layer with flash on, on the front to make it cost effective. You need to measure. Not every application will accept this, but there are applications which will accept this. And all of a sudden, you went from 3x to, less, to potentially less than 1.5x. And finally, operational cost is also running cost of your cluster, right? So looking at low power architecture, we, we, Canonical with Ubuntu provides support for all architectures that are important in the data center today, including ARM, which can be deployed in a low, low power configuration. So look at that as an inter interesting alternative. Storage for ARM is very interesting because there's no question around binary compatibility, right? Storage is storage. You either consume it as block or as a file with SMB or NFS shares or as object through a web API. So regardless of what you're using there, an alternative architecture on the bottom makes no difference at all. OK, so keep in mind this. When we did everything around the storage product launch, our core message was around pricing. And we were saying, make sure that you are competitive against public cloud pricing. I won't go into detail around what the offering is, but if you're interested in about talking about support for your software-defined storage, come and talk to me after the presentation, and I, I want to cover it in detail. This is a, an array of our headline customers for storage. We have many more storage customers out there, but these are ones that are headline customers that have agreed to say, we're proud to use Ubuntu Advantage supporting our storage. And these are the technologies that we're supporting. Scale.io and Quobytes are new for 2016. You'll see them come online this year. We'll do announcements this year at the right events for these ones coming in. Quobyte is very interesting, um, file-based, so shared file storage. Um, based, uh, it's, it comes from the team that's pioneered ExtremeFS. And EMC Scale.io, everybody has seen this in Randy's blog post, is the, it's basically a, a block software-defined storage system that screams is, what, is how they, they portray it. OK, so 
I just want to use the, the tail end of my, of my 20 minutes to talk about the new technology that's coming in in 1604. So if we're talking about putting storage on a diet in general, what's, what's helpful in new dieting technology um, that's coming in with the new release? So first, uh, we, and we touched on this this morning, that we for the first time are delivering ZFS as a production ready file system that you can use on any system out there. And this is much more around looking at system or single node configurations than it is looking at a, st a storage service. If you want to build a storage service on ZFS, you're going to have to put a lot on top of that. But if you're looking at a single system, ZFS is a very interesting storage alternative there. It's the first time that anyone's ever done this in a commercial grade or supported setting, ZFS on Linux, so I think it's a big step for everyone. But it's bringing into being on Linux an incredibly solid and performant file system. It's something which has seen many years of production use and as much as people are concerned around the controversy around whether ZFS on Linux is allowed at all or not, I think there's enough standing in, uh, existing today to say that AFS has been allowed on Linux for a long time, NVIDIA is allowed on Linux for a long time, and I'm sure the ZFS was not, de was not developed inside Linux. So anyway, sidestepping the controversy for the moment, if you want the questions you can ask me more detail, I have lots of opinions on this. It's an incredibly solid file system, and brings features into Linux that nobody, no other file system has today. So the first thing, the first feature really with Ubuntu and ZFS is that on Ubuntu 16.04, ZFS just works. You don't have to do any magic voodoo install compiler DKMS craziness. The module is there. Just mod probe ZFS and you'll see that it's loaded and the tools will transparently load it in the background if you're using ZFS anyway. ZFS, for those that are less familiar with it, has a couple of interesting features. The headline one, I think, is data integrity built in. Not only do you have block level checksumming, but because the blocks in ZFS, like in ButterFS, are laid out as a tree, you have checksumming on the tree level, which says every tree node has a checksums of all the children that are attached to that tree node, which means that you are safe even if data moves around on the disk. Um, it's, ZFS is interesting because it's got a volume manager built in. So you create basically a ZFS pool, and that pool is where you define addition, uh, new basically um, block devices that you're offering for consumption, but you can also define multiple backing devices. So you can use ZFS to substitute software RAID or even hardware RAID if you don't care about the hardware part of that. And you can use it like LVM to create additional block devices that you make available on top. Um, the volume management piece of it is very cool because it has thin provisioning and snapshots, something which we use heavily in LexD. And if you were here in the morning, you saw Dustin's presentation where he showed off just starting up LexD containers you, on top of ZFS and how fast it was and restoring from, from snapshots. So that's really one of the reasons why we looked at ZFS as being something that we could bring in. And finally, it provides you with this optional block level deduplication and compression. So with ZFS, you can say, turn on compression transparently, and the CPU will, will compress before data is stored on disk. And you can turn on deduplication on the block level, which, which will make ZFS basically track blocks that are being written and to see whether or not there's a, that block is already stored somewhere. Both of those have important trade-offs, which is why they're optional, but if, uh, fundamentally they provide you with additional flexibility if you're doing a deployment there. Anyway, and as I said, under the hood, the root of S for LexD containers. So if you do LexD in it, it will ask you if you want to use ZFS, and if you do want to use ZFS, then it will basically turn on all the magic knobs underneath for you. Okay, Ceph Joule. So the latest release of Ceph is now included with 16.04 and fully supported. The headline features here are CephFS, something that we've been waiting for a long time. I think Sage said that he started Ceph for CephFS, so it's great to see that finally come into production. And we're, we're actually actively working with customers on CephFS now. Um, better support for JIT distributed or multi-cluster setup. So if you've got multiple Ceph sites and you're streaming across them, either block or file, sorry, either block or object, then that's really been improved in the newest release of Ceph. And just in general, better object storage API coverage and compatibility. And this, I think, is an important change because if you, when people are looking at Ceph and comparing that against OpenStack, Swift, and S3, they often say, well, I won't use Ceph because the S3 compatibility or the Swift compatibility APIs are pretty thin. So this release, I think, is an important change in that. It's much better now. We're providing um, to customers an experimental dashboard that we've been working on that basically tracks per OSD performance. So it tells you what effectively the OSD is doing. If it's taking a long time to write, if it's backed up, what all the OSDs on the cluster are, are looking like. And I think most importantly for anyone who's run software-defined storage at scale, it tells you who your busiest clients are and which clients are writing the smallest 
are doing the smallest writes. And small writes, for anyone who's managed software-defined storage, is a, the performance killer. And so we've really built this tool to help you, when you're having a performance issue, look at the dashboard and figure out, okay, who exactly is causing me a problem and who is suffering because of it. This is a Ceph support matrix for 16, well, basically for the two LTSs here. This, this graph basically just tells you there, there will be one version refresh within the 1604 LTS lifecycle. For those of you that are not familiar with it, we basically make multiple versions of certain applications that are developed, that are delivered in the cloud archive, installable on the LTS releases of Ubuntu. And so if you were on 14.04, we released with Firefly, but you could install if you wanted to hammer on top. And now with 16.04, we're releasing with Joule, but we will offer the L version on top as well. Okay, Swift 2.7.0. So first, people often come to me and say, like, what, what is great about Swift? The great thing about OpenStack Swift is that it is a very simple system. You can sit down in an afternoon, understand from top to bottom how it works. So I think for in many ways, simple is very beautiful, and if there is a more beautiful object store than Swift, I don't think that there is. So headline features for 2.7.0. Finally, erasure coded, coding, which, is which has sort of been beta or not fully production supported for a long time, is now fully supported. And you can buy, buy and when I say fully supported, it means you can buy Ubuntu Advantage from Canonical and we will support customers that are using it. Um, there's an interesting change with Swift 2.7, which is it now provides concurrent gets across the cluster. So you can turn this on, but what that lets you do is basically have the proxy request multiple gets to the backend object storage nodes, and it will return back the first response it got. So this le lets you basically sort of load balance performance across the cluster because you're no longer dependent on waiting for a specific object server to reply to you. Now, the fastest object server that holds a copy of the data you're asking will reply back and that's the response that you're gonna get. Um, again, another thing which is interesting about Swift 2.7, improved Swift 3 compatibility middleware, something which is often a question, does the Swift work with, I don't know, um, Veeam or Avere or, or Veritas? So improved S3 coverage in general means that there are boxes that you need to tick for those vendors there and that there are more boxes ticked with Swift 2.7. And finally, um, some improvements in the API for um, manipulating SLOs, static objects. Um, these are actually really useful in at least from what I've seen in our media custo customers who are storing in Swift lots and lots of blobs of 4K video, and there they come to us and said, hey, how, when is Swift gonna get better at that? Well, 2.7 also brings lots of improvements there. Okay, and finally, the last piece, and I wanna do this as a lead-in to, to Deutsche Telekom, who's done a lot of work on OpenStack Manila, is OpenStack Manila is now finally getting to the point where customers are starting to use this in production or experimenting with it and setting it up to hook up existing NAS or NFS deployments out there into an OpenStack there. So Manila, Manila basically makes it so that you have the same first class experience that you had with Cinder for a block with shared file NASs. So effectively, if you've got a NAS out there and you'd like to get that NAS consumed inside your OpenStack or make that NAS as available inside your OpenStack, well, Manila lets you do things like create new volumes, assign those volumes to a guest, allow a guest access to a volume, which I think are the core things that, you're, that you need to do when you're setting up OpenStack and you want to consume existing NAS storage out there. Now, we're actively working with people on lead Manila implementations, and because as with any of these OpenStack integration points, Cinder, Neutron, Manila is one of those places where vendor interest and vendor involvement is important because you need to get the drivers right as well as the, the top level API. And so Deutsche Telekom, I'm gonna step down, and Deutsche Telekom, I'd like to have them come up here and tell us more about what they're doing with OpenStack, Manila, Ubuntu. Thanks. Hey, great. Hi, together. So, my name is Mark Fiedler. I'm from the Deutsche Telekom, uh, from the German organization. Um, today, we would like to give you an update about our activities in um, um, yeah, uh, our activities to bring uh, Manila in our environment and production. Um, so. 
for anyone who was uh, also on in the Vancouver summit, so we had there a talk and called this phase one. Now we spend a lot of time to um, yeah, adopt our findings and, and new features to bring this in a new stage. And so that's the reason why we take here phase two. Um, today I would like to, or we would like to uh, talk a little about our, about our collaboration model. Um, then we look a little bit deeper in um, yeah, our shared file storage technologies, what we have done, what, what, uh, what was our results of that. Uh, we would like to talk a little bit about our uh, environment. I think we changed this massively to the phase one. And later on, we give an overview about uh, what is working, what is new, and what is our future work. So that is yeah, the purpose of my or of our um, agenda for today. Um, yeah, at first I would like to give you a short overview about uh, Deutsche Telekom profile. Um, I think uh, probably a lot of people doesn't really know about Deutsche Telekom, so that's the reason for that. Um, yeah, we have uh, worldwide one, around 150 million mobile customers. I think that's impressive dates, and also in the fixed network uh, around 30 million customers, um, and uh, also in the broadband customers in uh, 80 million. The reason for that is why I mentioned this is that we have an in all three sectors of fixed mobile and online services, we would like to push massively our NFV targets and our NFV technologies. And that's the reason why we uh, yeah, developed in, in, in Germany uh, the global uh, architecture for our NFV purpose. Um, and yeah, also how we can integrate our shared file storage in this technology. Um, um, to look a little bit deeper about Germany and our purpose there, I think we are from Germany and that's the reason why I mentioned this here, uh, uh, is to see where we are and also uh, how many million customers we have there. Um, we are the biggest VDSL provider in Germany uh, and also have um, impressive uh, data of 2.7 million IPTV customers. Uh, we nearly um, launched a new uh, platform in Germany, the IPTV platform. So there's a lot of stuff who we must, would like to manage. So, okay, now we come to the Manila and that's why we are here. Um, our requirements um, are nearly the same as in phase one. Um, we have a strong demand of NFV and cloud technologies um, to optimize our telco processes. I think that is one of the main reasons um, why we push these activities here in this group and have um, organized a, um, a big collaboration with different companies and need a maximum of degree of autom to automate our infrastructure. I think that is to come to optimize our processes. I think that's the common need of that. Um, so yeah, and what is new, what, what, what we have changed in phase two uh, is nearly that we adopted our results from the phase one. Um, we take the lessons learned phase and um, look to how we, what we must change in the phase two to come, become more results and become more findings about what, what can be achieved when we are um, going to a um, multi-storage backend. Um, that means when we joined um, additional vendors and also put them in a, a physical environment. In the first phase, we had only a virtual environment. Um, yeah, that is mainly that. And now we are um, joined Canonical and also HDS in our uh, group. Um, that's the new vendors, to, to the difference to phase one. Um, yeah, and looking also, focusing mainly on the high availability. That means we had built up in an um, OpenStack um, environment physically on HA and also put them, the Manilas, on HA. Yeah, the partnering model, I think, um, as you can see there, for us, SDT is really important to, to collaborate with our partners to bring our needs to, to the community and just spread them over in the telco business. So I think that's the need and that's really nice that we have these five companies here and I would like shortly introduce the colleagues here on the stage. Um, to my right hand is Matthias Waljic from HDS. Uh, then we have Kapila Roa from NetApp. Christian Pfeil from uh, the German SVA system integrator, and Thomas Neuburger also from Deutsche Telekom. So now I would like to hand over to Christian. Yeah, thank you, Mark. Um, let us just quickly talk about the reason why we are following up with uh, Manila. 
So uh, therefore, I would quickly like to recall um, yeah, the, the, the features and, and the key concepts. So within the possible implementation flavors of cloud storage, there's basically uh, yeah, block storage, shared file services, and also object storage. Um, yeah, therefore, Cinder, for example, provides block storage that you can attach to one instance and that can format a file system on it and do whatever it wants to. Um, there you also have Swift, which is the scalable object storage. Um, the, the problem with that is not every application is capable today to use that, and there comes the shared file services in place. And uh, yeah, that is the fact why we deal with Manila actually. Uh, regarding the key concepts, um, yeah, we have obviously the shares, which is, uh, yeah, for example, NFS or SIFs. Um, since we talk about a shared environment, we have the access rules, which uh, we can use to allow access for different IPs that at the end can be tenants. And um, yeah, to tie the consumers and the actual share provider together, we have the so-called share network in Manila, which, which enables that. And um, yeah, if you want to deploy more advanced security services, you could also do that, like if you want to create a cabarized infrastructure or use Active Directory services. And uh, yeah, you could also use advanced backend functionality like, like snapshots uh, or thin provisioning. And uh, if we look about how that is implemented, that is always about a so-called driver. And the driver then um, makes use of the features that the backend uh, can provide. Um, one key thing to know is that Manila is not in the actual data path, so it's, it, it acts just as a, yeah, let's say a controller for the actual shared file service. Yeah, and with that, I would just like to hand over to um, um, Thomas, <laughs> <laughs> since he just uh, shows about the evaluation lab. Yeah, hi. Um, for uh, the evaluation, um, we uh, started uh, to set up um, a uh, test lab. Uh, for our test lab, um, uh, the, the goal was um, to uh, set up um, the whole OpenStack um, not only on virtual um, test uh, uh, environments. Uh, uh, so uh, we used a complete um, hardware setup with um, I think around about 26 servers uh, which were running um, OpenStack and um, also um, were installed with uh, Canonical's uh, HA mode for the um, control services of OpenStack. Um, also, um, we had uh, two storage uh, boxes, one from uh, NetApp and one from HDS. And, um, so um, the Manila uh, share service um, was running in a multi-backend mode, uh, so um, we um, were able to uh, create shares um, on the NetApp box and also on the HDS storage system. Uh, therefore, um, we used um, different drivers in uh, Manila, which were uh, capable uh, to manage uh, the storage uh, systems. Um, as you see on the upper uh, left side, um, there's, um, there were three LXD containers, um, which were hosting the uh, Manila API, and uh, also Manila um, scheduler and Manila share service. And um, the uh, uh, IP address for the Manila API um, is uh, in a cluster mode uh, established by Pacemaker. So uh, when there is a breakdown uh, of one LXD container, um, uh, yeah, the API switch over to another uh, container and uh, the API will still be available. Yeah, um, so what uh, was the evaluation, uh, uh, what is working, um, uh, what was the next steps uh, after setting up that environment? Um, we did um, scenario tests uh, also automated uh, with Rally. Uh, Rally is um, 
not only um, testing functionality, um, more it's more in um, benchmark mode. So um, um, when you uh, look at um, so that JSON file, um, that is a, a example of a test, uh, Manila uh, create and delete share. Uh, uh, as its name uh, said, uh, it creates and deletes shares. Um, the share protocol is NFS, uh, its share type is NetApp, and with a um, size of 10 gigabytes. Um, the runner from um, the, the task runner from Rally uh, starts uh, uh, five um, uh, threads and um, creates, uh, uh, in summary, 50 shares and deletes them with a concurrency of that five uh, threads from the Rally runner. Um, that enabled us to uh, not only test functionality, uh, so also to test uh, how uh, good is the API responding and um, also to see uh, if we have a breakdown, um, is the uh, HA setup um, working and do we see any slower API calls uh, while the um, cluster um, is uh, yeah, uh, uh, where, while the cluster fail over. So then we go back to Christian. Yeah, thank you. So maybe we could just um, explain that with a short demo or some, some high level graphs. So um, just to, whoa, do you want to wake? So just to, to have a look, um, on this slide, you can see um, we have our Manila engine, and um, below that, we have our different backends, which are, uh, yeah, we make use of the drivers. And what we do now with Rally is um, we uh, measure the time that it takes to create shares in parallel. So we are just hammering the Manila API and therefore the backend storage uh, in creating shares. And uh, the same goes with um, deleting. This is one simple example. And uh, yeah, let's just have a look at the short um, demo video. Hopefully that, that works and now we can, can see it. So on the upper left, um, we have the actual rally test run. And on the lower left, um, we just have a watch that shows the, the output of Manila list every two seconds. And on the right, we uh, display the volumes that are available on the NetApp storage system. And as you can see, when, when rally starts, um, you see it, it creates actually Manila shares and since it is not fast enough, it shows some creating and deleting and created. And on the right side, we can also see uh, the volumes that are created on, on the NetApp box, for example. And um, at the end, uh, then Rally is able to tell us how long the actual tests uh, did take. So for example, how long did the longest share create or the fastest need? And this is a very nice tool to just stress um, the whole environment and therefore gather a lot of uh, useful information about um, how that would work in a enterprise workload when you have thousands of clients that, that request shares and delete and so on. So to continue with the analysis, um, we had that in phase one, uh, what is working and what can be improved. So um, it is very nice that we have now the, the multi backend uh, in place. We have tested it with physics and uh, that is very nice. We also have our scenario tests with Rally uh, that can leverage different storage backends. Uh, and also we could do some performance testing um, according to the API. So it's in never about storage performance. It's always about Manila scheduler and API performance. And um, also very nice is that we were able to implement a HA version of, of Manila or of our OpenStack cloud and uh, we also um, were able to use heat that was one of the things we missed in phase one um, another thing that is very nice uh, that had improved over time is the vendor documentation so for example if you look at NetApp or hds they have nice information in place that documents the driver and um, its functions um, it from our point of view it would be nice if there would be some single point of contact for documentation so that you do not have to search uh, at HDS or in the Manila wikis and so on so that would, would be nice to, to cover that um, what we discovered when we implemented was also that it was for us not very transparent how Manila worked but that was not 
related to Manila that was related to us since um, we established both storage backends and it only did use the HDS storage for new volumes when we did not specify it. And after some debugging, we found out that uh, this is related to the fact uh, how the HDS uh, system uh, shows up the, the capacity since that was all SIN provisioned. And yeah, that was a little bit of a struggle, but, but again, that's not related to the vendor or, or to Manila. It's, it's just was not too easy to find out. And it would also be very nice to get um, migration. Um, we had that in phase one. There is a lot going on, but uh, I think it will be very hard to migrate, for example, from HDS to NetApp. But uh, we will see what, what comes, yeah. Um, now I would like to hand over to the colleagues from the vendors to um, yeah, just continue with the analysis. Yes, I will briefly talk about the uh, first three showcases, uh, use cases, what we did. Um, we started off uh, with a use case which is basically an extension of uh, the use cases which were done in the first phase. Um, it was about um, uh, share creation, but now um, that uh, the dedicated storage backend could be addressed in the share creation. And um, as um, Christian already told, um, we did uh, also a Manila-driven placement. The user-driven placement was done by specifying uh, a share type, um, which we um, created, one for Hitachi, one for, for NetApp, and it was possible to uh, address the dedicated storage backend with the different share types. Um, the second uh, use case was about snapshot handling. That is something which was not done by DT uh, in the first phase. Um, uh, the snapshot handling worked very well. So at the end, uh, on, the, on the Hitachi NAS, a snapshot uh, which was created ended up uh, in a tree clone uh, on, the, on the HNAS. And uh, the snapshot handling uh, also making the snapshot available um, as well as uh, deleting the snapshot, everything uh, was uh, as expected. Um, the third uh, use case we did was uh, about um, um, uh, integrating pre-assigned um, shares into Manila uh, with the Manila Manage. Um, the Manila Manage also worked um, um, as expected. But also there we, um, we found um, a different behavior of the different storage backends. In the Hitachi case, um, the, um, the export um, was after the uh, Manila managed command under the, under the same export pass uh, as before. Um, and uh, that was a different behavior what we uh, saw from uh, the other backend. But in general, all three showcases, uh, use cases were um, working very well. Uh, the, fo the fourth use case that we tested was to consume these shares outside of the scope of OpenStack. So we have lots of bare metals and other cloud, cloud environments. Uh, and the use case was that, can I use Manila and actually use this uh, platform or this service to consume shares outside of OpenStack. And we could easily do that uh, after we set up the net networking right. And we did this uh, within OpenStack and also we, uh, sorry, we did it manually and also using heat templates. And the sixth use case that you see here is about resize share. So we could easily resize shares, extend them or reduce the size of them. and. Uh, this we could do non-disruptively. So in case an application is consuming these shares and we resize it, it was able to work properly and there was no disruption. Yeah. Yeah, um, and the last use case we have is um, testing the HI, um, uh, HA mode um, we set up uh, with the Manila API. Uh, th therefore, um, we started a rally um, test script, uh, which uh, massively creates and deletes uh, shares in parallel. And while that uh, test run um, was going on, uh, uh, I was the bad uh, admin guy who killed one of the LXC containers, um, which uh, was uh, hosting the um, Manila API. And um, yeah, the good thing was, um, 
it worked and uh, the, um, uh, the, the API, um, the, the active uh, IP address uh, switched over to another LXC container and uh, the API was uh, available again after that switch and um, also all uh, following uh, create and delete share operations were successful. Um, while the failover, um, we saw that uh, uh, yeah, a, a small number of great requests failed. Uh, that's just cause of, um, they were still in work on the uh, failed server. Um, but uh, from um, admin perspective, it uh, was okay, uh, cause uh, uh, we have a clear state of um, all shares uh, the the same state also after the tef test uh, we had the same state uh, of shares in Manila and also on the storage backends so we have no difference there were no um, um, yeah uh, interruption huh? yeah yeah so um, that was the good news it uh, works re really well only need this one, so um, I go forward. <laughs> um, so yeah, we're coming to the end and uh, that's time for the conclusion from our side. Yeah, our summary is um, against to, or we formalize this in phase one in, in another way, but in the second phase we say, okay, Manila becomes enterprise mature. That means we, we yeah, as you have seen, we have fulfilled all our use cases and our test cases. Um, yeah. The Manila uh, works, by well, uh, works quite well in the HA deployment. I think that's really important for our productive environment to see how the OpenStack side and also Manila side is working together and then with the uh, storage boxes behind. Um, and the community vendors addressed our requirements. I think that's uh, really important. Our further steps uh, would be yeah, to take more enhanced uh, performance tests, um, also to test how the environment works if the hardware is broken, um, more or less on the OpenStack side. I think the test is not on the cluster side. On the storage backends, I think that's known from the last 10, 15 years by the storage vendors. Um, and also, actual not covered was the Manila security perspective to integrate with an LDAP and Kerberos system. I think that's really interesting, but also a lot of work. So um, that means that yeah, we have some work to do. and. That's the first steps we will do. So, yeah, thanks for your time. And if you have questions in the end, we can yeah, talk about both, sec both sessions. Am I, am I back on? Okay, do we have some time for questions? Some five minutes? Yes? Okay, I'll say yes. All right, so any, any questions for, for the Deutsche Telekom team or for myself? Please go ahead. Uh, you, you may make this very easy on us. <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah. It's for you guys. I heard the question, but it's actually yeah, a question for this team here. Can you repeat, here. please, in some? Sure. So the first question is whether there's any support for quotas. So the first question is about user driven placement. The user driven placement, oh, right. What challenge is that presented? I similar thing, but also back end but not Miller related. Um, you know, why? So you know, then quotas, you know, follow up to that quotas. So support quotas and is that like so user driven placement or we have the I our idea behind is that we have uh, gold, silver, bronze models in the storage backends. That means we have cheap storage, we have um, um, yeah, storage with a lot of um, services behind, and I think that's a different model where we can uh, say, okay, you, um, this, uh, from the perspective of the customer, they would like to have the silver model, and then we um, modify the, the Manila-driven placement in the storage. And quotas? Sorry? And quota? Um, Are there any um, we didn't actually, we didn't test it. Okay. No. All right, okay. there's a question in the back there before. <laughs> I 
That microphone probably works, the one that you just walked by. I hope, maybe. OK. Hello. Okay. All right. Um, I have a question about uh, Pacemaker and CoroSync. Um, were you, are you using unicast or multicast for the heartbeat? I'm curious because I'm, I need to bring up a uh, CoroSync Pacemaker thing in our OpenStack, and uh, multicast is an issue, and I'm just wondering how you solve that. Do you know the answer? Go for good, it. Good question, uh, but uh, I, I don't really know about uh, one of, um, of uh, Christian's uh, colleagues uh, said uh, he uh, did the setup. So, so let's take it up offline, and I'll, 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 I'll come find you after the, the presentation, and, and I'll, we'll discuss it there. Okay, I have to clarify. Uh, sure. sure. Any other questions? Yeah, sure. Ah, okay, so the question is, is there any use for, is Ceph being used on top of ZFS? Is that it? So the, the answer is no. By default, the Ceph that we support on, on, on Ubuntu is run on XFS on, on the bottom. And you can run on AXT4 as well. Those are the two supported file systems that we use underneath Ceph. There's a new file store that's being added with Ceph that may be able to consume raw block devices, but currently it's not used yet. It's, it's only come in with the newest version with Ceph Jewel. And the other question you asked was about deduplication, is that what you said, or, or compression? Ah, yes. So if you do run Ceph on top of a compressible file system, so ButterFS or ZFS in the bottom, then yes, you would be able to get the benefit of block level um, compression before storing to disk. But today, no one's really t running that in any tested configuration, and so we're not ready to support it yet. We are looking into what's, what, it's, what it means, basically, to change that, to change the file system underneath Ceph, and to still maintain the SLA guarantees on top. Any other question? Final one? Yeah, go ahead. The question is on sequential workloads on ZFS. Is that what you, is that what you said? Sequential workloads on ZFS. Well, the whether we've run them or tested them or have we tested sequential workloads on ZFS? Yes. So largely, the ZFS performance for sequential workloads depends on what the configuration of the storage underneath the pool is. Uh, you're, you're talking about the patho pathological cases where you do have RAID Zs and you get very bad sequential performance, right? Yeah, you mentioned earlier you're talking about um, having a service that you already configured with designing uh, clock gate or whatever. Yeah. Is there, you guys no. So to keep, just keep in mind, ZFS will be very new. So for instance, Swift and Ceph, as we are delivering it today, are not <laughs> delivered on top of ZFS. So in our reference configurations, it'll be done on XC4 or XFS, which within Linux have seen much, much wider testing. We're bringing in ZFS, and if you think about it, any technology, as production grade as it may be outside of Linux, when you bring it into Linux, it will go through its own maturity curve. And so realistically, I expect that within the 16.04 time life cycle, you'll see ZFS become more and more stable and more mature as the, broad, the vast variety of users are encountering it for the first time. The first time most Linux users will see ZFS at all will be now. And so they'll start doing their own Z pools and figuring out what the performance is like, and we'll take that into account. But for people that are already experienced with ZFS on Linux and are looking for a partner, then Canonical is there for them. And for people that are experimenting, we're also really willing to encourage that because that's the only way ZFS will get better. Go ahead. Do we, re do we recommend ZFS for Cassandra or MongoDB? In truth, we don't have enough experience in production running either of them. As I said, we're providing ZFS. This is the first snapshot people have ever gotten of ZFS on Linux in a supported state. So we're working with lead customers on performance characteristics. We will support stability up to the SLAs that we, that we state. So if you have an issue, we will definitely address it. Performance, though, is a sort of thing which takes time for us to really get the experience and bake it in, is, is, the, is the honest but not so great answer, I guess. All right. I think we're up for time. So thanks very much, guys. Thanks. Thanks. Cheers. Thanks very much.